Hello, everyone. Um, it's really good to see you all. It's probably been a bit of a long day of talks because I know it's in the afternoon right now. So I'm really glad you could come here to see my talk on narrative focused video games development with RenPy. So just before I get into the meat of the talk, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, I run Quill Game Studios and it's a small studio and I really bootstrapped it. So I took on the role of the software developer, the game writer, the project manager and marketing, et cetera. Um, in terms of my full-time work, because I actually do the video game studio as a hobby, uh, I do, ACE, which is a machine learning live stream YouTube channel. So you can actually find it if you search uh, aggregate intellect or AISC machine learning live streams on YouTube. Uh, it has around 11K subscribers. And in my full-time work, I work as a senior data scientist and I use Python. So I'm very excited that I'm able to use Python for both my hobbies as well as my full-time work. Yeah, so that's like an old picture of me. I just have it because I'm eating a pani puri, which is, I believe, like a street food in India. Um, so I'm based in Canada, but yeah, I sometimes uh, uh, my coworkers took me to some places and I could get that. Um, so I started this game project around end of 2017, but I feel it has been longer. So it is creating the game, designing the game, and there is game writing as well. So I wrote the story first before I started coding it in Python. Um, so it actually has been a really long, long, long journey, but I want to share in this talk how Python helped me and how RemPy, this open source engine, has helped me. So just to take a quick look at the end product, it is a game called The Summer with the Shiba Inu. Um, it launched last year on Windows PC, Linux, and Mac, but then I did a console launch this year. Um, and it's actually sold fairly well so far. And I'm really glad that I was able to use Python and the tools that were built with it to be able to generate a little income with a hobby. So, the overview of the talk is going to be three parts. Uh, the first, because I understand that not everyone might come from the gaming background or gaming industry, I'm going to give a bit of an outline. So please bear with me on that part. I think it'll really help understand like why uh, Python could be good for games as well as an overview of the industry in general. I'm going to talk about the specific subset of games that I can make with RenPy because it's not going to make all types of games. Um, and then I'll go a bit into the source code as well as different types of design decisions in the uh, Python-based game, game engine RenPy. So a little bit of an overview on platforms. There are, I guess, the main computer OSs as well as consoles. So I launched my game on all of these. There's uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. So there is, the gaming industry is fairly big. It has all of these, but then it also has mobile as well, which is another huge, huge, huge industry, um, which I personally am not that familiar with. So I'm not going to really go into that. Um, I did look up the console gaming in India. It's fairly large. Uh, it's very popular. And the head of Sony PlayStation, and this is just one of those consoles, claims that around seven to eight million people play on the console quite regularly, and then mo even more own the console uh, in the first place. Um, there are some different types of studios, and I'm going to walk through this because I want to come at it from a developer perspective, like kind of flipping the mindset of when you are playing the game as a gamer, to the studio who is developing it, because that is kind of the core of this talk. So the first type of studio is commonly called AAA studio. So they are huge. They have funding. They are kind of like video. Uh, they're kind of like movie studios in a sense. They could have millions of dollars USD in funding. 
as well as they ship very, very popular games. Like uh, I looked up what's popular in India and I think FIFA, The Last of Us are heard of or known in India, um, Overwatch as well, and Assassin's Creed franchise. So these are made by companies like Blizzard, um, Naughty Dog, um, Ubisoft, which are huge. They have millions in funding and they usually sell millions of units as well, right? So when you think about it, one game in the US is could sell for 70 US dollars and they could sell millions of copies. So they make a lot, a lot of money, but their spend is also a lot because they could have from hundreds to thousands of game developers on their payroll. So this is one type of gaming company. And I want to contrast this with a popular kind of way of making games nowadays. It didn't used to be so commonly seen. Um, indie studios are small and it's short for independent. So these are usually studios that don't have a huge budget like the AAA studios I showed you just before. They could be made by one person. They could be made by five to 10 people but then all the games I've showed you, actually Stardew okay. Valley, it sold millions of copies like in the first week. So the guy who made it basically became a millionaire in the first day. So these stories are very inspiring. And it also shows that it is possible to get into video game development as a solo developer. And... Some indie games have a large budget or relatively large budget. So it could be ambiguous if they are triple A or if they are indie. Um, so I know that PUBG is quite popular in India. And I just uh, heard of some news that they had also a esports team that recently signed on uh, to a very popular uh, esports franchise. So Games like these, they also have millions of players, but yeah, it, it's kind of like their team is smaller. They're not as big as Ubisoft or something like that. Um, so, so there could be some ambiguity in it. So just to take another look behind the curtain before I kind of go into why I could use Python to do things like this, uh, it's just to take a quick look in other roles in game development, right? Because it's not just a programmer that makes the game happen. Right, Because I, I program in my full-time work. If I was just programming and the game could magically appear, then I would be happy. But actually, no. Um, I had to outsource the art um, because I cannot do art myself. Um, I'm a very bad artist. But when you think of games like Pokemon, right, you don't really think of, oh, what's their like engine um, running on? Or you don't really think about the physics in their code. Um, what you might come to mind as a gamer is really the art style. So it's not only the programmer in the games industry that is important in creating a distinct game, but rather a lot of other roles like the writing or um, the art as well as the producer. So the producer is kind of like the director in movies in, in case that term is not that familiar. They're usually the ones who tie everything together and have some sort of high level direction, um, but they're not necessarily doing the programming themselves. But those roles are absolutely necessary and they're actually billed as very, very high up in the credits in games, just like directors of movies. So there's a lot of roles, but of course, I'm going to come at it from a programmer perspective. Um, however, just uh, letting you know what I learned during the process that, okay, a lot of these other roles are absolutely crucial or the game will not really be shipped. So yeah, I have talked about the AAA studios, which has millions of dollars in budget, which I, as an individual, I don't have and aspiring game developers probably don't have either. So I had to enter it through the independent development portion and which means low budget, um, which means using open source tools and Python is one of them. Um, and I already used it in my full-time job as a data scientist. So the learning curve was slightly uh, less, but it's a bit different, um, kind of a different type of mental model to use than data science, but um, it has the great documentation. And also you have to think about game um, objects as, yeah, it's object-oriented programming. So that's really helpful. 
to be able to make that cross into the uh, indie game development. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific types of games that this engine is going to use. Because before I have mentioned some games like FIFA or something or like Overwatch, and those could be 3D games and they are like, let's say, shooting games or um, like planning, like running around and kicking a soccer ball um, that you will not be making that type of game in Rempi. Uh, that will be better handled by other engines like Unreal Engine or Unity, which is I'm not going to cover here. Um, so I'm going to just like kind of narrow it down what 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 Rempi is doing. So. Narrative-driven games are quite popular. I bring up an example that's not a video game, but it's a popular series on technology, uh, like a sci-fi technology um, TV series called Black Mirror. And they have this uh, kind of video where you can make choices, right? You can choose to accept an offer. You can choose to refuse. You can choose to like jump out a window. You can choose to not jump out a window. And then after you select that, the, the movie will go into a different direction. So... This is kind of a narrative-driven um, kind of narrative design, in a sense. That can be done in movies, books, games. So these, I bring up some popular examples of games. Like this is a very, uh, I guess, famous um, game series called The Nonary Games. And this is a like a murder mystery um, where people kind of kill each other, in a sense. But apart from the mystery, there's a lot of dialogue. Because you ha you see on the screen, there's so many characters. They all get to know each other, get to see what each other's weaknesses is. But that's all conveyed through dialogue. So you can see at the dialogue box below, like these games are very popular. I would say it kind of started in Japan, but like these are very popular in the West. I'm not very sure how how much this particular series sold in India. I couldn't uh, really find that info. But in even in uh, U.S. and Canada, it's extremely popular. And so are games like the recent Persona 5. You can see there's a lot of dialogue, even though there is some other um, types of gameplay like fighting um, and stuff like that. But in between, all of these are dialogue and narrative driven. So these types of games are the types that are suitable for Rempi development. Another example is Danganronpa, which is also very popular in, I guess, like both the West as well as in um, Japan. And... The thing is, the three examples I've mentioned, they are they are more like AAA. Um, they have custom game engines. They have much more developers than I could afford to hire, um, despite being one myself. So they have a lot of resources, but it's hard as a solo dev because it's costly. Um, so I just wanted to... Um, actually, I eat these Parley G cookies a lot in uh, when I was working at the office. Now I work from home. So like, I, I wanted to convey this feeling where, oh, it's like, wow, there's so many games you could make. Um, you could make a custom engine, right? But it's just too expensive. I, I can't do that as an independent developer. And I'm working full time. How do I have time to do that? Right? So it's like the feeling when you are dipping it in chai, and then it just falls off. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. Um, but I discovered Rempi which makes me feel better. And I was able to do all of those things that I thought I couldn't do before. So now for the remaining of the talk, after we have now kind of gone through the gaming industry, the types of gaming studios, and why I was able to join gaming in the first place as an independent developer, right? Because it seems very hard. Um, I want to show how... Python and Rempi helped me do that. So Rempi is open source. Um, it's totally free. It's royalty free to use, right? Which kind of fixes that problem of like the custom engine. But you also want to think like, okay, it's not a custom engine, but can it actually be flexible enough to do everything I want to do? Can I make high production things? Or is it like drag and drop without a lot of customization? No, but that's that's not the case. Um, so from Nano Reno, so Nano Reno is kind of like a one month sprint um, where game developers get together to make this kind of um, story driven, narrative driven, visual novel <laughs> types of games. All of those are mean kind of the same thing. Um, I just bring them up because you might see them in the news or in popular media. They use all those terms interchangeably. 
Um, so from these like one month sprints, which are just for prototyping or um, MVP, minimal viable products, to very, very high budget games. And you can just find it on GitHub, um, the engine, as well as they have a site where you can download. Um, yeah, so from nano reno games to very high budget games you can make with Rempy. And the creator's philosophy is he wants to make the best way to make visual novels and give it away for free, which is what I would say he did. And as it's open source, so you can actually make pull requests and uh, he triages them and he uh, merges them sometimes. So yeah, and uh, object-oriented programming is standard in game development. And I'll explain a little bit more on that. Um, but namely, it is helpful to use Python because um, I, I guess before, right? Because the popular gaming engines like Unreal is, I guess you can use C++ and Unity, which is another popular one, is mostly based on C Sharp. So one might think, oh, okay, I, I know Python. I like Python. I'm not sure if I could make games in it, but yeah, it's not the case. It's it's all OOP. It's all very standard in game development. So you don't really have to worry about, um, apart from the kind of 3D part aside, the design choices and stuff are very similar. So um, I just wanted to bring something really quick. Um, as you can see in the code to the left, I'm not sure if you can see it, RemPy actually, apart from just, pure, just normal Python, it also has a lexer. So that just means it reads um, this kind of more human, uh, human friendly language into Python code at the back, back end. So then what, what this means, what it does is it's a bit more human friendly. So like Python knows that a lot of non-programmer people might want to make games, right? Like if you're a game writer, if you're a game artist, maybe you want to program your own game. So he actually made this in the engine. So sometimes if you see the code I show later, which does not look like standard Python, it's because it's actually converted to Python um, in the back end. And then you're able to use um, just some more machine friend, uh, human friendly language in it. So I want to showcase some of the capabilities of RemPy. Um, the first one is an example with Doki Doki Literature Club, which is a game that's been downloaded millions of times. It's kind of become viral. Like there's tons of videos, like Twitch streams on it. There's even people who make mods of it. And it's a visual novel game made in RemPy. So you can have a lot of visual effects in it, um, not just this one, but um, this is just an example of kind of the way the developer made the game creepy. So it's like a creepy game with jump scares so that they, like things just like show up on the screen and they kind of like shock the player. Um, so these are all things that you might, that might seem familiar to you. So a lot of the visual effects are actually implemented as classes. So in this source code, um, I hope it's big enough, but basically all you need to know is that there is a image dissolve class and there's, this is just one of the many, many visual classes there are. Um, but then you can actually just like define a sort of transition um, image file in there. Like I hard coded the path, but as you can see, like there's a lot of customization that can be done in the class. You can even modify the class itself um, to create different visual transitions. Um, so this is just one example. So hopefully you can see the uh, image as well. Um, so it's like if you have a transition, you can create um, animations like this and much more. And they are just all in your very familiar like Python classes. That's how they're implemented. And actually for me, I when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is familiar. Like I, I know how to do these. Um, just to show another type of game that is made in RemPy is it can capture really complicated variables. So this game is a is called Long Live the Queen, and it's a strategy game where each game each day you um, do different tasks. Like you're like, oh, I need to train this princess figure to um, study 
books or study law or should she go horse riding or something but it's like extremely complicated it's like a super um complex strategy game but then when you peek into the source code like all of these trackers they're just like all being captured in um the rempy and python in the in the back so it's like able to create these extremely complex games and just like evaluate them as the player is going on so here it'll say like oh your um, stats are not high enough you're gonna fail or if you're gonna lose and you might die because you didn't do like the right combination of things um yeah so it's able to capture these very complex um, player interactions as well as complex player strategy and respond appropriately. So I think that Rempy is able to create very, very complex logic um, in the game. So actually there's like something pretty interesting, um, which is it has a 3D camera now. So it's kind of like 2D, 3D. It's like you have 2D uh, characters in a 3D environment, and then you can kind of pan the camera around for more animation options. And this is fairly interesting. I personally have not used this in my games yet, but I really enjoy that just an open source engine can have this kind of functionality. And like, I'm honestly very grateful because it allows one to create um, very flexible types of games. So one last example I'm going to show is that Okay, you might think that, okay, these games kind of start to look similar, like they have a dialogue box at the bottom, right? But actually, you can just change it however you want, because these dialogue boxes, they're actually just like menu classes, um, which is, I guess, a familiar way of thinking, like you can just inherit them, change them how you want, like, um, it's, it's really, really flexible. So I really do enjoy that. Um, part of Rempy because you can make the game really look um, high budget as well as customized. Yeah, so in my own game, I'm going to show a little bit more of the uh, just like the basics of the code and high level how I did it. So here is when a player makes a choice. Um, you can see there was like two choices to select and then you wait and the player might read the choices, think about it because the choice will actually impact the story's ending. Um, so they will take some time to think about it. But I was like, OK, I'm going to make a timer to just like tell them how much time they took to make the choice, as well as create some random dialogue after that. So it doesn't, um, so it'll say like, that took some time. So this was done in what you can see is very familiar and even basic Python syntax, right? Just import random, import time, and in, it's in the game. Well, well, not exactly that simple, but like this is stuff that you might be like, oh, like this is any anyone who knows even a little bit of Python could do, right? So you just have start time, get the time. Yeah, you just like subtract the time, and it takes. Um, you just there. You have a timer in the game of how long the player took to make the decisions. And there are some other fun things that I did as well. Um, so you can use just like decorators and everything, like stuff that you are totally familiar with in Python. You can use like format string, another thing you're super familiar with. Um, so what I did was you, um, just to make the dialogue not seem so stale or repetitive, like it's not like every day, every time they're saying, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's like, Oh, good morning, or how are you? So you just import random and do um, just like pick random one out of these strings so that every time they will say different things. So it could be like, hmm, or interesting, or wonderful, but not always like the same thing, not like wonderful, 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 right? It kind of gets boring. So this is just like very, very simple Python code, as I'm sure you can all easily understand. Um, and have used before. But actually, this what this does is it allows the game to have a little bit more interactivity with the player, and the player is able to notice these small things that you can implement. And these are just the most basic examples that I showed. Um, there's much, much more. Um, but I wanted to kind of show that game development is not as mysterious as it seems to be, because that's what I thought at the beginning as well. I was quite intimidated by these AAA studios 
their budget, as well as the graphics, right? So there we have it. Uh, you could easily remake. This is one of the examples I showed earlier, which is not a video game, but it's a movie, which you can select choices and change all the outcomes. You could actually make it in RenPy as well. You could remake it. And there's another tool called Twine, which is a bit different. But um, on the screen, I think on the behind the scenes, they actually said they used um, Twine, which is also popular with RenPy creators. Not, not for coding purposes, but kind of how to sort out the story. Yeah, so your imagination's the limit with RenPy. I've showed a lot of examples of how flexible um, the engine is and how you're able to uh, make changes and make the game really feel like your own, as well as have a lot of types of animations um, even though it's not exactly 3D graphics, which are more expensive and more resource heavy in which I would use the other game engines. But for these types of 2D narrative driven games, I would really suggest to use RemPy. And even though it's open source and royalty free, and that's not a bad thing at all. Like, in fact, I'm so happy that it is. I was able to afford to make things like this with existing skills in Python. Four yeah. Minutes. Awesome. Yeah, so if you want to check this out, you can definitely go to uh, their GitHub, RenPy, and you can check out the um, the repo as well as my game, A Summer with the Shiba Inu. But I, I want to encourage you to check out all the other games that I have listed before as well. So if that kind of interested you and you're able to kind of have an idea of a game and you want to make it in 2D and have some story driven choices, definitely just go download it and check it out. So you can contact me at these places. Um, yeah, so thank you very much once again for coming to this uh, one of the last talks of the day. Thanks a lot, Susan, what a great talk. So we have. A couple of questions that, depending on time, we'll see how many we can take. So the first question we have is, is RenPy and RenPy 3D different modules or just sub-module? Ooh, actually, that's a good question. I'm not ex extremely sure, but I would say it's a sub-module because I think um, they're not separate. I think you might have to download. Um, I don't know if they connected a third-party plugin, actually, because there's another thing that I know. Um, called Live 2D, which is actually a third par third party um, plugin. But then I actually forget if the 3D um, camera itself is one of those. But if anything, um, you're able to kind of get it in the same development environment, I guess. Yeah. So I'm not personally sure what the exact difference is. Yeah. There's a lot of integrations. Um, so mostly I work with RemPy that is kind of by its own, but then um, RemPy Tom has made some third-party integrations that I've mentioned, uh, yeah, with the live 2D, which is a separate thing. So that is Got possible, it. yeah. Yeah, there, there's another question. Any good open source tools for creating anime? Ooh, so actually for this, I have in the um, kind of, in the process of finding artists for this, there are some free art tools that I have found that are popular. One is called GIMP, G-I-M-P. Um, so, well, the G, I think, actually stands for like GNU. So, I mean, it's open source, as you can tell. <laughs> so um, that is one really good tool. Um, and a lot of very, very skilled artists, like it's almost comparable to, okay, I don't want to make claims because I'm not an artist, but I hear it compared to Photoshop itself a lot, which is like super expensive. Um, so. I would suggest GIMP for making anime art. Um, yeah. Awesome. One last question. What are some good tutorials, references for RenPy for someone who is just starting to learn or get into game development? Ooh, yeah. So actually the RenPy um, distribution, it comes with like a set of tutorials, which is very, uh, it's kind of like a mini game, which is a tutorial. So um, it's very, intuitive. So I would suggest literally just downloading it and then it actually has all that stuff inbuilt. And it helped me a lot. It It is a very well-made tutorial. Like it even has the source code 
as the animations are showing up. <laughs> so how kind of how I showed you. So it'll have like the visual display of what will happen. And then it just has the source code right there. So I would really suggest like its own tutorial very first. And the documentation website is also very um, robust, which is, yeah, I guess very in line with what the Python community is generally. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Susan. It was a great talk. And I see the chat is flowing with the same thing. We really appreciate it and have a good day. Thank you.